Hi, everyone. This month opened up with a student group in Texas called Voters of Tomorrow, making plans to deliver books such as Art Spiegelman's Mouse, pictured here, and Toni Morrison's Beloved, to students in Texas and Virginia in reaction to proposed book bans in these states. Now, it's not my place here to discuss the content of these books or their merits. I do want to note that the article points out what I suspected would happen from the beginning, and that is, and this is a quote from the article here from ABC News, the banning of these books has piqued interest in their contents. Hey, I'm an 80s kid, and my generation dealt with parent advisory stickers on our music, which just made us want to buy it even more. And banned books are not a new idea. Heck, we even have a banned books week, which, according to Wikipedia, is an annual awareness campaign by the American Library Association and Amnesty International. It's supposed to celebrate the freedom to read and draw attention to banned and challenged books. It's also supposed to highlight persecuted individuals. According to Banned Book Week, bannedbooksweek.org, which will be linked below, the week was launched in 1982 in response to a sudden surge in the number of challenges to books in schools, bookstores, and libraries. If I'm leaving this story uh, with anything, it is hopefully clear and not so subtle that the name of the youth-led protest group is Voters of Tomorrow. Politicians, you may antagonize them at your own risk. All right, story number two. Story number two is um, from February 9th, 2020. This is by Griffin Riley at the Columbian at Ridgefield High School in Washington State. Instead of walking out, a few dozen students walked in unmasked. A few parents were on hand to cheer them on. The students are not only frustrated by the mask mandate being in place so long, and here's where I fully agree with and support them. They are frustrated that they have tried to go through the proper channels and uh, tried to have their voice heard, and they claim that they have not heard back from anyone. For me, the issue is important, but so is the feeling that they aren't being heard. If you just hear that students are protesting masks, you may have one reaction, but they seem quick to mention that they also take issue with being ignored. Apparently these students who participated in, in uh, the protest that day went home after about an hour or so from assembling outside, but they were also seemed to be apparently, according to Riley here and the Columbian, um, inspired by some other schools in that area that also had similar protests. This is an interesting line and I'll link the story so you can check it out uh, more in depth. Uh, district spokesperson, Joe Vagert, said the absences would be marked as unexcused without a letter from a parent explaining the reason for the absence. I don't work in that area. I would be interested to find out um, if that same uh, unexcused absence policy would have applied to any other protests or, or previous protests that um, had to do with masks at all or, or anything else for that matter. So um, interesting there on the um, protest there in Washington state. All right, um, now addressing these protests, Education Week and Evie Blad over at Education Week magazine weighed in with an article on February 11th titled, when students walk out in protest, here's what administrators should do. Ultimately, the quote I wanna focus on here is this, quote, when students walk out in protest over issues ranging from school policies to national political concerns, it can cause massive disruption and student safety challenges. Three administrators with expertise in such situations told Education Week. But handled well, the protests can give students a chance to explore and understand their constitutional rights. That's one. Two, express their fears. And three, process powerful emotions, end quote. These three pieces, and I will repeat them, exploring and understanding their constitutional rights, expressing their fears, and processing powerful emotions is giving me pause. 
I would imagine in some of these protests, all three are happening in varying degrees at the same time. The same is probably true for adults who have been out there. While most of us do not initially respond well to disruptions to our daily routine, some attempts at empathy towards protesters of any age might help temper our responses. While citing recent walkouts from the last couple of years in states like Iowa, Missouri, Colorado, and California, which we will get to in a minute, this article quotes a superintendent as tracing recent walkouts to youth protests following the school shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida in 2018. The article and its recommendations for working with protesters and laying ground rules instead of punishing them uh, may take advantage of what we in education call a teachable moment. And there's a link here for you guys to check that um, piece of work out a little bit in a little bit more detail. All right. Um, the next one is is a, a lot more, more serious here. Sorry. The next one's a lot more serious here. Uh, this one is about some uh, teachers going on a hunger strike in Oakland, in Northern California. And Ashley McBride, who I, I cite here, um, who's doing amazing work both for the local paper and on Twitter, is uh, really covering this in depth and you all should check out what she's doing. According to Ashley McBride, writing for oaklandside.org, the Oakland Unified School Board in Northern California announced that due to its budget issues, they were going to look at closing schools as well as merging some schools. The district apparently considered using the following criteria to determine school closure candidates. One, standardized test scores. Two, reading levels. Three, suspension rates. Four, absenteeism. Five, teacher retention. Six, enrollment trends. And finally, other metrics, quote unquote. According to McBride's article, around the year 2000, OUSD started supporting the small schools movement, while at the same time, charter schools began popping up in that area, contributing to some of the current issues. Critics of the plan also uh, say that closures would disproportionately fall on schools attended by black and brown students. Some who oppose the expansion of charter schools in Oakland point out that emptied school buildings could be then legally leased by charters. And I think some people are also suggesting that that might be the plan all along. Other opponents of school closures say they drive students out of OUSD altogether. Last year's report showed that um, when a local elementary school called Kaiser closed in 2020, about 16% ended up going to non-OUSD schools. After the Oakland School of Language closed the same year, about 15% of its former students completely left the district. Two staff members at Westlake Middle School began a hunger strike. Initially, they said, until their demands were met and no schools were at risk of closure. Although their particular school, Westlake, was declared no longer being merged or relocated, Andre Sanchez and Moses Omalade continued starving themselves. An Instagram called Hunger Strike for Oakland Schools was created to chronicle their journey. The pair's demands were for no schools in Oakland Unified District to be closed, relocated, or consolidated with any other schools. For the state to use its budget surplus to pay the remaining balance of the debt that OUSD owes to the state. They wanted job protection for teachers and staff who were protesting the closures, and they wanted to meet with both school board members and the superintendent. And ultimately, they wanted to meet with the governor. They remained on hunger strike for 20 full days until some compromise gains were reached. I have linked Abby, uh, Ashley McBride's uh, very thorough work for you to read more. Let's see here. And finally, um, just like two weeks ago when we were doing our coverage of January news, um, I wanted to end on a, uh, on a positive note. And um, all right, 
even though by now many of you have heard or seen it somewhere, yes, this is a story of elementary school kids, uh, kindergartners actually, who established a telephone number for pep talks. Yep, pep talks. Uh, they even spell it P-E-P-T-O-C. It's called Pep Talk. It's a free hotline. Uh, it's a project from students at Westside Elementary, which is a small school in the town of Heldsburg, California. And I know today was California heavy. I apologize. I'll try to spread it out more uh, here in the future. Uh, here's the number. If you call 707-998-8410, one of the options is to get your Pep Talk or you could ask for words of encouragement. And they have an option in Spanish also. I called it. I thought of calling it right now and using my speaker to let you hear it. But after getting my own words of encouragement from these kids, I think you should call on your own. Again, the number is 707-998-8410. Uh, the article is linked. It was by KQED, which is like a, a part of uh, NPR. And there's also a link within that um, article to donate if you can. Kindergartners giving you a pep talk. Don't miss it. Well, those are four um, items in the news I'm following here in education. Um, and uh, teachers, if you're tired and you're feeling uh, a little bit run down, I see you. Uh, I'm with you. Uh, it's not just you and it's not just in your area. We can get through this. If you're not on break this week, you will be soon. Recharge your batteries. Take care of yourselves. Try to be there for those kids. Meet this moment and the kids in front of you. I will see you guys soon.